Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. God is good and all the time. Wonderful. Um, it's great again to be here, uh, to be continuing with our conversations on um, the journey of faith. And I'm so glad that we have an occasion like this uh, when we celebrate new members. Uh, they are an important landmark in the progress that the church is making at any given time. I think we'd be worried if nobody wanted to join membership here uh, for whatever reason. But we thank God that um, we have a growing community of faith uh, of men and women who are continually committing themselves um, to the journey uh, of faith. Um, I'm also grateful that my wife is here. She's my only wife, so I can call her my favorite wife. <laughs> Maybe I said something wrong. Let's see what will happen. Yeah. Thank you, sweet. Yeah, all right. You know, as a man, you humble yourself. You expect everything or anything. I'm your little sick with your home. Um, I was at first time tempted to go to the New Testament text that talked directly to the question of membership, but I thought since, um, you know, the faith journey is exactly that, it's a journey. So we'll continue with the journey of the Israelites, um, in, you know, after crossing the Red Sea. And last week we, we saw a little bit of, I hope, some encouraging glimpses of what it means to be led of God. And, and, and uh, hopefully... It showed up our confidence in the fact that we not only have a wonderful God, a gracious savior and redeemer, um, but that we saw that there is no opposition that is so great that we can't depend on God to completely fight on our behalf and vanquish the enemy. We saw God watching the battle in real time from on top of the pillar of cloud and, and looking at what's going on with his people, we saw him intervene, you know, as, as the Egyptian chariots were jammed and their wheels could not drive and they could not catch up with the Israelites. Before that, we had seen how as the enemy closed in, the angel of the Lord who was walking ahead of the Israelite army withdrew and came to the rear, a defensive position. We saw how the pillar of cloud also, you know, removed itself from the front and came and stationed itself between the Israelites and the Egyptians, bringing darkness to one side and light to the other. God is so involved in this journey. Sometimes he feels like he is far away, but he's so, so, so near. He can feel your heartbeat. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's going on. We said he knows your address. He positioned them in a place called Baal Zephon, the exact geographical location where he wanted them. Because he knows your address and where you are at right now. Whether you're thinking about physically or emotionally, even psychologically, he knows your address and the battles you're fighting. He knows what's oppressing you, what you fear. And he says, I'm here and I'm near. And I'm able and I'm willing. Just bring that thing to me that I may show you that I'm a God who does battle on behalf of his children. And this is what happens. We'll be looking at chapter 15 of Exodus. One of the reasons that God had gone out to redeem for himself a people, to save them and call them his own, is because he wanted these people who have been shackled by all kinds of challenges and weights, who had been slaves answering to another master's call, whose souls had been embittered with hard labor. He wanted them free. And not just free, he wanted them free indeed. Why? To give 100% of their focus to the worship of this good God who is not like the taskmasters of Egypt, 
He was gracious and good and kind. For a change, they would have a master who thinks about them, who provides for them, who leads them, who protects them, who even heals them, rather than the other master who would afflict them and burden them and then bitter them. A very different master. So his dream was that these people would be 100% given to God because he was going to give 100% of himself to them. And so one of the things he did, he wanted them to see the evidence of their freedom. And so on the eve, not on the eve, after they had crossed over, that very morning, they witnessed the bodies of the Egyptian army, commanders, horses, chariots, washed ashore, dead, never again to rise. And God wanted them to see this. This is what I've done for you. After 430 years of oppression, this is your enemy. Look on him. Look at him. He will never again rise to oppress you. There is no threat that you will face, that I can't vanquish. And I don't know how long your enemy has held you captive, how long your taskmaster has had his grips on you, how long the enemy has had you habitually addicted. I may not know that, but I know it's not 430 years. It's not that long, because you haven't been around for that long, I hope. But God is saying, there is no length of time that the enemy has held you captive, in which I can't break through and set you free completely. There is no level of addiction that I can't rescue you from. There's no habitual sin that I cannot help you break. The Lord has provided for you and for me power to break every sin, every habit that will prevent you from wholly being given to God. For whoever the Son sets free shall be free indeed. This total freedom is the reason that God saved you in the first place. And so if there's anything standing between you and the true worship of God that stands between you and your ability to wholly give yourself to God, whether it's a sin or a habit or whatever it is, chances are that it represses you, it holds you back. And you come before God with either guilt or fear or anxiety. God is saying, that wasn't the deal. I want to deal with everything completely so that when you're before your father, you have freedom to worship. You can sing. You can rejoice because your father covers you. And that's the reason that I saved you. So think about that. And God had them witness the enemy lying, helpless, dead, never again to rise. So that they know they never again have to watch their own back. God will be watching them. They never again have to hold back. There will be no retaliation against them from anyone. Because God was to be their all in all going forward. Has that been your experience in your journey? And if it hasn't, what is it that holds you back? In which areas? Have you given the enemy a foothold? And now he represses you and he oppresses you. And your voice is not free to vocalize the praise of your God, the God who saved you. God wants every ounce of energy, every ounce of heart and mind and soul and body given to him 100%, all for God. And he's going to give his all to you. And there will be no end of praise and worship. No end of the kind of miracles and wonders that God will perform among his people. And people will come to you just to hear the testimonies of the activities of God in your life.
the natural reaction after a great deliverance that follows great oppression is that our hearts just rupture with praise and with joy and with thanksgiving. And this is what the Israelites do. They pen down Exodus 15. It's called the Song of Moses. It's the natural reaction to great deliverance. They've never seen anything like this. It's unprecedented in all history that a whole multitude, a big community, two million plus, would walk in through the Red Sea. The waters held on either side, and they will testify and say, you held back the waters like a wall. They stood firm, and we walked on dry ground. God made a way where there seems to be no way. And they would recount the goodness of God in their lives. I don't know how long it took to pen down this song. We know that it takes quite a number um, of, I don't know, hours or weeks or months to pen down a good song, and I believe this was a good one. But this is almost spontaneous, probably the very same day. The song was written down, practiced out, and sung out in praise. Let's hear some of the things that they say. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Today I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the English Standard, ESV, English Standard Version, mostly because it's got large prints and I can read them clearly. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Note how the journey is beginning to progress. Praise is no longer something out there. It's been personalized to my experience. And, 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 and I, I hope that as you read this, you begin to envision for yourself what praising God for you should look like. That, that you and I need to be walking closely with God. We need to be recording the journey for ourselves and for posterity. But above that, that this needs to feed our vocabulary of praise and prayer going forward. Because this is what we are doing. We, this, this, the things that are said here are historically accurate. This just happened. But coming and welling up from a heart of gratitude, it becomes a song of praise, it becomes a prayer, it becomes words of worship. So if you wonder, what do I tell God? How do I worship him? What should I pray? Record it from your own journey, from your own experience, from your own walk with God. Recount the days when you were in despair. Maybe you had a loved one in hospital and you said, oh God, the God that I worship, come and heal my mom, come and heal my brother, come and touch my son. And you cried out to God and he heard. When that is done, don't just move on swiftly. Sit down and meditate. What just happened here? This was the situation. This is what I did. This is what God has done. Record that. Because tomorrow, there'll be another enemy that will rise. And when he does, then you have vocabulary to come before God and intercede, and intercede on behalf of your family, friends, loved ones, church, nation. Oh God, the God who heard me when my son was sick and I cried out to you and you answered me. Now see before me is this situation. And I know that you are able. And you cry out to God. And when you do, God knows your voice. He says, that's my son crying out. That's my daughter. I need to heed and pay attention. She remembers what I did. And she's here again, asking me to intervene. And I will. And when that happens, your own journey changes. Your own relationship with God looks different. And in the future, many people who can now testify about your walk with God 
will come to you and say, you know, I know that God hears you and he answers your prayer. Would you pray for my relationship with my wife? You know, we're going through a really tough season and I'm afraid that this relationship might fall apart. Please pray for us that the Lord will prevail. I know he hears you. Because you've recorded your journey and you have developed a vocabulary of intercession, of praise, and of prayer. And this is what we read. These were historical events, Israel's own experience that is now a devotional for us and a prayer and a song of praise. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. I'm not recounting from other people's experience. He's my strength. He's my song. He has become my salvation out of my experience. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. So he has included himself. Before he was the father of Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Probably the God of Moses as well. But now he's saying, uh-uh. He has become my God as much as he's God of my fathers. And I will exalt him. You take ownership of praise and worship. It's not something that the worship team does here in front. It's something that I do. I will exalt him. I will praise him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. How do you know he's a man of war? Because you cried out to him and he has done battle on your behalf. And you earn the right to give this metaphor, these names to the person of God. He is a provider because I know that I was in luck. I cried out and here I am. He came through for me. Pharaoh's chariots and his horse host, he cast into the sea. And his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils. The waters piled up. Look at the development of faith in this community. Now they're beginning to capture the size of God, his magnitude and his power. It's no longer even his right hand now that's doing battle. Just a blast of his nostrils and the seas are parted. And you will see this progressive revelation as they encounter more and more of God. And all those encounters will be through serious challenges. The enemy will rise up, but God will come and vanquish him. And you will see the metaphors changing. And at one point, Solomon is going to build the most magnificent temple worth billions of dollars or shillings or euros, whatever, inlaid with gold. And after it's done, he will pray. And he will slaughter thousands of animals. Because he's just imagining the size of this God. Then he says, oh Lord, come and occupy this magnificent structure. And then he will say to himself, but hang on. Will God live in a house made by men? The heavens, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. The earth is just your footstool. And as they experience God, they will come to begin to capture just a little glimpse of the magnificence of God and how significantly superior he is to everything that we know or think about. The blast of your nostrils will cause the waters to congeal. The flood stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue and I will overtake. I will divide the spoils. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. 
So he is the enemy's boast. But here's the Lord's reply. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in his glorious deeds, doing wonders? If we had even a small glimpse of the wind that is behind our sails, you would know that you are unstoppable. That there's nothing that can prevent this ship from reaching its destination. Because the power behind it is the most powerful, majestic, glorious, amazing being that ever existed. The power of God blows on our sails. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? We settle for so little when God can do so much in and through us, if only we would let him. If only we would trust him. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. We said last week that God is a God of purpose and his salvation is taking us somewhere. It's not a random chance. From the day he called you, he marked out the path that you must walk. And there's nothing that will stop you from reaching your destination. Because he has mapped out the path. The reason he redeemed you is so that you fulfill the purpose that he had for you. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The holy abode was Canaan, the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. There's nothing that was going to stop that journey from happening. They were going to arrive in Canaan. Why? Because God said so. And it was his intention from the first place. The journey from Ramesses to Canaan was not to take 40 years. It was to take a few months. He takes them through the desert, teaches them a few lessons, how to trust him, gives them laws, then they enter into the land of promise so that they can be the people of God to represent the glory, the goodness, the power, the provision, the protection, and the prosperity of their God. There is no enemy without that was going to stand on their way. And woe to him if he tries. They would be vaporized, literally, by God. The only enemy to watch was the enemy within. That's the most dangerous enemy. What cost them 40 years in the desert was not the Canaanites, was not the Philistines, was not the Egyptians. Those were done with. It was their inability in their hearts to trust that God is good, that God's intentions are good. And they kept imputing ill motive. Oh, the reason you brought us here, we know. You wanted to kill us in the desert. Were there no graves in Egypt? And they kept on and on and on. Eventually God said, okay, you know what? You want to die here? We can do this. We can do this. It's not that hard for me. I'll arrange for it. In fact, none of you who heard and have seen of what I have done from the day you left Egypt until now, but have continually tested me, none of you who put a marker 20 years and older, that's the 
the age of accountability from God's perspective. None of you will cross the Jordan. None of you will ever see the land of promise. You know what I'll do? I'll let you die here. Then I'll take your children and I'll let them cross and take possession of the land you have rejected. The enemy within. Let me tell you something that you need to know. God in all his power, in all his majesty, in all his glory, in all his loving kindness, in all the statements that he says, it does not give me pleasure to see a sinful person die, but I would that you all came into salvation and came into my presence. Not even that God is able to save you against your will. Hear that? Not even God, in all his amazing power and glory, he breaks through any barriers, any enemies, not even him, is able to save you against your will. The enemy within. Let me tell you what he will do. Because he's faithful, and he will give you your chances. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, if any woman would hear my voice and open that door, then I come in and dine with him and he with me. He will not break through your door. He will not crash through it. He will wait for you to open it. Because that's how love works. If you won't have him, it's okay. He will feel rejected. It will give him deep sorrow. He will groan. He will mourn because he knows the consequences. But he won't force himself on you. That's how gentle a God we serve. He will let you see his glory, his majesty, the benefits of being under the shadow of his wings, the blessings that he gives, the protection he provides. He will let you see this. But the option of loving him is all yours. He say, I'm here for the taking. You take me in, I'll give you all of me if you give me all of you. But you shut him out, he remains out. The only thing he won't stop doing is knocking. I'm still here. If you will open, I will come in. And you and I can have fellowship. And you know what? We don't do I, I, I am not one of those who does, you know, touch and go. When I come in, I will stay. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you till the end of the age. And then after that, beyond the age into eternity. But I will not force myself on you. So beware the enemy within. There were people who were saved, redeemed, ate the heavenly manna, ate the heavenly food, you know, were like Moses is baptized through the Red Sea. They never saw the land of promise because the enemy within, even that, God could not break through. Their hearts were shut to him and he could not get through. Think about that. The enemy within. But there remains the heavenly abode. Like we said, we have, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. For us, is the new Jerusalem. Still awaits the faithful of God. Those who will say yes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, come Lord Jesus, come. I give you access, I give you control, I give you my life over. I was steering this ship up to this point. You know what? I have no idea what I'm doing. The sea is too vast, it's too rough. I have lost my compass. I don't know where I'm going. So you come and be captain over this ship. Steer it. 
and take it to the shore that you intend. And you know what? There is no ship that is captained by Jesus that will not arrive at its intended destination. He's a good captain. He knows where he's going. And you will arrive safe and sound. But you need to hand over the reins to him and ask him to captain the ship of your life. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. These are the enemy lands that Israel is going to pass through. And because God is not faced by the enemy without, those are a non-issue, non-consequential. In fact, by now they are trembling because reports are beginning to come about what has happened. That Egypt, the superpower of the ancient Near East, is no more. It has been vanquished. The army lies dead on the shores of the Red Sea. Why? Because God is fighting for Israel. There is now a superior power that is rising. So the, the, the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Because God is coming. And he's coming with his people. And this is a perspective that is lost to us. We are so engrossed in our little lives and our small challenges, we fail to see the bigger picture. Whose project is this? This whole salvation project, it's by God and it is of God. And it will not fail. And no, you're not going to be defeated. You won't fall by the wayside. No, it won't happen. It may seem so. But because of this book, we know how the story ends. We all arrive. We are all victorious. Especially if we guard against the enemy from within. The heart that doubts God. The heart that backslides. The heart that is wooed and enticed by the glitter and the glories of this world. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as stone. Till your people, O oh Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. This mission won't fail. And this ship will not fail to arrive at its shore, at its stated destination. And let me tell you something. We all value the things that have cost us much. Would you agree? If you bought a new car, you value it greatly, right? Have the time when you arrive and you park in the garage, you are wondering, should I sleep here or should I go to the house? They have that effect. If God has blessed you with a new home, you call us and we dedicate it because you are grateful. It costs you a lot. It's very expensive. And you guard it and you protect it and you celebrate it. Think about this. The Bible says you are not your own, right? You were bought at a price. Do you know that price? Do you know how much you cost God? So if God is doing an asset evaluation, who do you think ranks at the top? Who cost him the most? You cost him everything. He had to make adjustments in the Godhead, the Trinity. Some had to be subdued for this plan to work. Part of God had to die. God is immortal. Shouldn't die. Doesn't die. He had to take on flesh. A degradation beyond anything you can know or imagine. The creator becoming a creature. So that he could do as man what God cannot do. He can suffer. 
he can bear sin. God is holy. Pure light in him, there's no darkness at all. He became sin. Not he was sinful, he became sin. The very embodiment of sin. Until the father had to turn away from him. In that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? It was not a rehearsal. The father turned away from the son because he had assumed the nature of sinful man. And the reason God never came for his son is because he cannot be unfaithful to himself because he said the soul that sins shall do what? Jesus didn't sin. But he bore our sin. Therefore, the wages of sin is he had to kill his son. That was the cost. And turn away from him. So do you think God is casual about you? That somehow your salvation you know, depends on how well you maneuver through the landmines of life. Who would leave a costly purchase like that to chance? So quit doubting yourself. Quit second guessing the journey. Quit wondering whether, you know, we will arrive safely or we will not. The captain of this ship is not about to give up the reins of that which cost him everything. There is no enemy outside there who can resist the power and the will of where this ship is destined to dock. Let's align ourselves with him and his purpose because it will come to pass. And when everything else fails, this ship will still be sailing on the high seas. And it will be the only ship that is left with Christ as its captain. Through the breakers and the roughness of the seas until the mission is accomplished. Because it doesn't fail and he won't start now. Commit yourself to God Commit yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Commit yourself to the purpose of God. Commit yourself to the church of Jesus Christ. Because when every other institution fails, including government, this is the one ship that will still be sailing. This church. And may you and I be found in it. Submitted to God and to Christ its captain. So that when we dock, then we can be welcomed. Well done, good and faithful servant. I don't even know why he welcomes us as good and faithful. We are not. Just because we didn't jump ship, okay? Somehow he looks for ways of incorporating us. Calls us my fellow workers in my vineyard, when half the time we are hurting the farm. But nevertheless, he's a gracious God. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Welcome to the kingdom of your father, prepared for you before the foundations of the earth. It's not an afterthought. It's not something he cooked up on the way. It's always been the plan. May God keeps us sober to know how great an inheritance and a promise that we have in Jesus Christ. And listen as we close. Till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them on your mountain. So it's thought through, even the destination. The place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your abode. For them it was Jerusalem. 
the city of David, the city of God. For us, it will be the new Jerusalem, the city of God. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. So the plan is done. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you.